Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the last project. <coughs> this is episode 7, the episode in which we are going to be going out to Duna, which is the, the most typical landing site for a interplanetary trip, an interplanetary trip. And we have kind of been putting off doing it, so I figured, hey, haven't got much time to record a video this week, I might as well just go for the one that would probably take less time. Did it take less time? What do you think? And that explains why this video is uploaded not on Friday, maybe not even on Saturday. Hopefully on Saturday, I don't know yet, I'm recording it on Saturday. And, uh, yeah, so we're going to be intending to go out to Juno, but if things like this keep happening, I don't know how likely it is that we'll get there. Before I start uh, my usual commentary ramble and get really into the flow of speaking, I'd like to point out that you may be hearing certain noises in the background. And no, that's not a euphemism. Just as I decide to start recording, someone starts deciding to- or someone decides to start erecting scaffolding! Next door! Yes! I'm talking to you, man, outside my window. God damn it. And there's nothing I can do about it. And if I could, if I wanted to, I would go outside and ask them, Oh, do you know how long you'll be erecting scaffolding in an extremely noisy manner for outside? But I'm currently naked, so I can't really do that. Here we are with our unique modules. I decided to summarize the orbital section of our trip today rather briefly. And uh, unfortunately, not only are the scaffolding men paying me a visit today, also is Danny. Danny has decided to pay me a visit today. So as soon as I dock, it starts falling down to Kerbin, and game crash. <laughs> what the hell that was? <laughs> I should start. I should restart this recording, shouldn't I? <laughs> No, I'm, I'm not doing drugs today. I'm, I'm really, I swear I'm not. <laughs> I was really upset actually. You know, I think two episodes ago, I like repeatedly said I'm on acid, and I was oh oh I'm so funny making jokes about illegal drugs, and then I read this comment from a mother who was letting her children watch my videos, um, because you know I'm as as far as YouTubers go, I'm probably one of the more child friendly. Maybe, maybe. And then she hears me joking about illegal drugs and posts a comment saying, Sorry, Harv, I don't think it's very appropriate, so I'm not going to let my children watch you anymore. And it's the comments like that which are entirely justified and are about the children who watch this that make me really, Oh, damn, I've done something wrong. I'm so sorry. Uh, I just let my... I let my ego and my brain get away from me sometimes and be like, Oh, I'm so funny making jokes about these things. And whenever that happens, it always turns out to be wildly unfunny for someone else. And it, uh, it makes me really despise myself at times. Luckily, it's not enough to stop me from continuing doing this. So I guess the rest of you, the vast majority of people who either do find it funny or don't care either way, are fine, right? Anyway, so we've been assembling our ship out of unique modules. We've got a, uh, a habitation module for an atmospheric plant that we've just picked up. We've got some RCS tug capability, and we've now detached a smaller, well, I'd say a medium-sized transfer engine from this station right here. And unless we are going to hit the station, no, we seem to be okay. We're going to actually send this out to our fuel matrix and pick up a whole load of fuel. Because the engine on this one is chemical, not nuclear, which means that it's a far, far inferior <laughs> engine. It, I can just I can just see this metal beam just floating past my window. God damn it. Um, it means that it's really, really inefficient. So basically, we're going to need a lot more fuel to compensate for that. The reason I'm using inefficient engines or an engine for this is because June is quite close and... I'd rather not, like... I don't know, I, I I just feel like varying it up a bit. You know, there were a lot of things about the last project which are really quite repetitive, so I thought, you know, why not vary it up? We'll use some chemical engines for once. And you actually notice that I had a launch stage engine even, which is very, very chemical, as chemical standards go. Uh, but I've actually ditched that now, because we used all the fuel that was in it, and there was no point using it over the little skipper engine we have. And we detach our ship in half, we use the tug to go get some Kerbals using our habitation module here. 
and then we reattach it back in the middle where it previously was and then we'll be putting this entire thing all back together. Honestly, if I could record on another day I would, but I can't, so I'm sorry about the noise. I bet you can't even hear it. I bet after all this you can't even hear anything. You, you must be able to. It's so loud. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'll be able, maybe it'll get cancelled out in noise removal. That's a thought. Anyway, so we've got our ship ready. We've got our skipper engine. We've got a load of fuel. We've got a load of RCS fuel. We've got our four Kerbals in their atmospheric lander. We've got our unique module, which is... Pff, I don't even know what it is. And we have a rover sitting within the... Uh, it makes it look like a skateboard park, doesn't it? The way the rover and the wheels are oriented such that they're in the base of that. If I could land that upside down, and I could be able to, like, drive the rover. I don't know. Anyway, here we are at Duna. Or Juna, or D Dune, Dune. Here we are at Mars, and it's the red planet. And it looks very beautiful when I have the UI turned off like this. And I don't know if I... I didn't mention, but I don't know if you saw. We have a high energy transfer. We decided to actually spend a bit more fuel. It was about 400 meters per second extra, I think. Which meant that rather than meeting Juna at our uh, Apohelion, which would be you know our Apoapsis just our orbit around Sol or Kerbal, uh, we actually met it significantly sooner than that, which means the mission time was quite short, which is nice for the Kerbals. But it also means that we entered the Juna solar system at around 4.5 kilometers per second relative to Juna. Which means that we have to go quite low. I think this was a 7.9 kilometer above the surface error braking maneuver. And it succeeded in slowing our orbital trajectory or our orbital velocity such that we actually stay within Duna's sphere of influence rather than pinging right through the system without really much thought. And rather than slowing down into an orbit around Duna, I'm actually going to get out of the atmosphere and burn in such a direction, at such a change of velocity, that was a weird pronunciation of direction, Harvey. I know it was, wasn't it, Harvey? Yes, indeed. Uh, in order to actually get an intercept of Ike, because we've come all the way out to Duna, although I suppose Duna's the closest, so all the way isn't really justified, but we have come out to Duna, and as a result, we might as well colonize Ike at the same time. But Harvey, you haven't got any non, uh, what should we call it, landers. You've you haven't got any non-atmospheric lander modules, how are you going to get Kerbals down? And you may be hoping that I'll do what a few people have done now, which is uh, EVA to the surface, but no, in reality I'm nowhere near that fun. I have a better idea. We have a rover. Now in the past, landing rovers on atmospheric bodies hasn't gone particularly well for this series. Although admittedly, I think our space program has come a long way since then. And who am I kidding? So what I'm going to try and do is land the rover on the moon. The unique module will have to stay landed on the uh, atmospheric body because it lands via parachutes, in theory. Totally not foreshadowing anything there. And instead we'll get the Kerbals into the rover that's mounted here. And they... Oh, there's a nice seat there. I can just about reach that seat. I can board in. And if you take a look at the Kerbal, his head is actually stuck in a fuel tank. I'm sure he doesn't mind. I'm sure he doesn't mind. So we'll get the other Kerbal out. And we have four in total on this mission. So we'll split them evenly between Ike and Duna. Because, of course, the, the capacity for living on Ike and Duna is about equal. Yeah... <laughs> Yeah. And we can simply undock the rover at this point, because the rover has a powered landing system. It too has parachutes, but it's a bit more of a hybrid. I was worried that I would have to position this a bit more carefully. So it actually has plenty, plenty of Delta V to land on something like Ike. And that's what we'll do. We'll adapt our mission profile. And that's why I like this series. Rather than building to spec and then carrying out a mission, Using what we have in orbit and then adapting along the way brings that kind of... Ooh... Feeling. You know, that one. So we'll be deorbiting from this 40 km orbit around Ike, and we'll be hopefully, hopefully, landing on the light side of Ike, or at least in the sunlight somewhat. And time warp down. Now, Ike's gravity is pretty low. There's actually not much to it. It's a pretty light body. So we can slow down pretty quickly. Pretty, 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 pretty. You're expecting me to go pretty, aren't you? Anyway, so we come down and I fire the engines too late. And in spite of uh, the quite fast 
impact there. We actually bounce, rather like the Philae Comet lander. <laughs> Except this time we actually don't bounce several times, and it's not up into a kilometre in the air. So it really is nothing like the Philae Comet lander. And actually, the landing leg also sinks into the floor, which is quite nothing like the Philae Comet lander, because it discovered that the surface was too hard for anything like that. They were actually expecting it to sink into the floor. Um, because the density of the, uh, what is it, P67? I can't remember what the comet's called, but basically the density was expected to be more like powder. And so it, would go into, it was going to absorb the impact of the lander with the ground. But no, it was rock solid, so it just actually bounced off, which is funny. But ours did appear to sink down there, so I decided to relocate after several side flips to a different location. And I dropped the rover out from underneath in this very beautiful design. And it's got no electrical charge. For some reason. I don't know why. I, I have no... Uh, this is the first time I actually have absolutely no idea why. Now, you may be thinking back to that crash. It's like, oh yeah, remember the, um, the thing? The brief mention of our launch stage dropping, uh, colliding in a ball of fire with this rover module. And it's like, yeah, that could do it, yeah, that could do it. No, I checked the log. That only destroyed the reaction wheel. And now the rover's upside down. It's upside down. F f fantastic. So you lost electrical charge, and now you're upside down. You, you, know what, you know what, I'm going to leave you. I'm just going to leave you. I'm going to leave you. I'm going to go off with this fully functioning lander, which uh, only two of the landing legs are actually folding in, for some reason. You know what, this fully functioning lander doesn't seem to be functioning very well at all. I think I might just leave it and actually transfer back to our mission and go land on Juno, which was the first intention in the first place. And, um... Yeah, so now we have the fully parachuted out modules, which are going to, uh... I mean, look, look, Ike is colonized, right? Ike is colonized. We've got rovers and two kerbals down on the ground, and also we'll have an impact crater where that thing landed. Um, and now we can just go land on Juno without any worries, right? Except we don't need to kill our transfer engine, because we actually have quite a lot of fuel left, and it's pretty much enough fuel to actually fill up the entirety of the transfer engine's tank, giving it around uh, 2.8 kilometers per second, if I remember rightly. So this thing can just get into orbit around June, and that's fine. And we'll uh, burn straight upwards in order to lower our apoapsis and raise our periapsis, which is a good technique that you might want to learn at some point. Um, it's helpful for getting circular orbits. If you've passed your apoapsis and you're heading towards your periapsis, say you're about halfway between them, you can actually just burn straight upwards, which will bring your your apoapsis closer to you whilst raising your periapsis. Um, it's a good way of circularizing. It's a non-standard orbital technique. Anyway, so we have that. That's escaped. And then we can detach the... Uh, the empty fuel tank now and leave it to crash into the surface at extremely high velocities because we have this really high... Um, angle right now, we're heading straight down towards Juna, but you know, obviously we wouldn't, we wouldn't want our uh, modules to actually take that route, because that would be suicidal. Uh, so instead, um, we'll probably use the engine to, uh, um, hang on, we, we just, we just detached the engine, didn't we? Oh, it's alright, we can use the RCS fuel, I'm sure that, I think at this point I, uh, I used the RCS fuel to push a bit 90 degrees so that we can actually, uh, I've just undocked the RCS thing. And now I'm burning the RCS tank away. Oh, the RCS tank's pretty valuable as well. It's got a lot of fuel in it. So I probably don't want to crash it into the surface of Juno as well. Crash it into the surface of Juno. Okay, so I'm going to get into it. Okay, right. So we have an engine and we have RCS fuel in orbit around Juno. Fantastic. And now we have two habitation modules, which are certainly not... In fact, they are quite far from being in orbit around Duna. And with no source of propulsion, alongside a rather high orbit of velocity, alongside a rather scary trajectory, I wonder how well this will go. Why don't you place your bets now in the last two minutes of this video? So we time warp down towards Duna. And we have our unique module with its multitude of parachutes that will surely slow it down in time. And we have our habitation module mounted proudly on top of the unique module. And with its two brave kerbals inside. Uh, 
Why do I get the feeling? There goes the parachutes, there go the flames, there goes the altitude. <laughs> There goes the pitch of my voice. And I'm about to undock when actually the parachute's open, and bang! Okay, well the unique module is actually largely still intact, funnily enough. But where are the kerbals? Where are the kerbals? The kerbals are alive! Uh, the kerbals are alive, which is all well and good. And they can float down, and we can open the landing modules. So, despite the fact that this really high trajectory was rather dangerous, the Kerbals actually survived, which is really quite nice. And land, and tip over, and survive! There we go, fantastic. So the Kerbals are indeed well, and happy, on the surface of Juna. Abandoned. Oh, landed on the surface of Juna. And we also have a transfer engine and an RCS fuel section in orbit, and... Oh, I saw a really big shadow. It turns out it was the parachutes covering the sun. Our parachutes will block out the sun. Then we will plant flags in the shade. <laughs> Juna landing! Yeehaw! See, I can do American talk. Um, yes, and there we go. So that's pretty much it, actually. We actually have Kerbals on Ike and Juna, which means there are two more off the list. No one died this episode, except there were a few mistakes here and there, so hopefully it was somewhat entertaining. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked the video, please do like the video, and I shall see you all next time.